It's a pleasure, brothers and sisters, to introduce our fireside speaker tonight. Elder Neil A. Maxwell has served as a member of the Council of the Twelve Apostles since July of 1981. He served as a member of the Presidency of the First Quorum of the Seventy from 1976 to 1981. A lifelong educator, Elder Maxwell was Executive Vice President at the University of Utah at the time of his appointment as Commissioner of Education for the Church Educational System, where he served from 1970 to 1976. During that period of time, he also served as an assistant to the Council of the Twelve. He earlier has served as legislative assistant to United States Senator Wallace F. Bennett of Utah. He has authored 23 books on religious topics. Earlier has authored many articles on politics and government for national, professional, and local publications. A political science graduate from the University of Utah, Elder Maxwell also earned a master's degree in that field from the same university. He has since been awarded honorary degrees from the University of Utah, Westminster College, Brigham Young University, and Utah State University. Prior to his call to direct the Church's worldwide education system, he served in a variety of positions, including the Bishop of the University, University of Utah Sixth Ward, member of the General Board of the YMMIA, a member of the Adult Correlation Committee, as one of the first regional representatives of the Twelve. He is a return missionary from Eastern Canada. He currently serves as a director of Questar Corporation and Desert News Publishing Company. He has been active in public service for eight years as a member of the Utah State Board of Regents. In 1967, he received the Liberty Bell Award for Public Service from the Utah State Bar. In 1973, he was named Public Administrator of the Year by Brigham Young University. He is married to the former Colleen Hinckley. They are parents of four children. They have 21 grandchildren. Elder Maxwell has the unique ability to preach a sermon in a sentence. It is our pleasure and privilege to hear from Elder Neil A. Maxwell. I wish to talk to you <clears throat> about your unfinished journey. It is the journey of journeys and will be described quite differently this Easter night. It is an arduous journey. The trek awaits. Whether one is rich or poor, short or tall, thin or fat, black or white or brown, old or young, shy or bold, married or single, a prodigal or an ever faithful. Compared to this journey, all other treks are but a brief walk in a mortal park or are merely time on a celestial treadmill. The journey is embodied in an invitation from the resurrected Lord himself, who inquired, What manner of men and women ought ye to be? Then he directed, Verily I say unto you, even as I am. Making this journey qualifies us eventually as the men and women of Christ. Confirming this developmental goal, the Prophet Joseph Smith declared, if you wish to go where God is, you must be like God in the principles which God possesses. Peter likewise spoke of the manner of persons we ought to be in all godliness. The scriptures provide the road map for this journey because it is the word of God which will lead the men and women of Christ in a straight and narrow course and land their immortal souls at the right hand of God. Jesus, our guide and our model, had a perfect guide and model himself. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Just what Jesus saw the Father do, 
including pre-mortally, we do not know. But Jesus was the perfect pupil, and he had a perfect teacher. Each of us here tonight is at a particular point in the journey, having come thus far. However, if we are deflected from this journey, we will instead become estranged from Christ. For how knoweth a man the master whom he has not served, and who is a stranger unto him, and is far from the thoughts and intents of his heart? If we are not serving Jesus, if he is not in our thoughts and our hearts, then the things of the world will draw us instead to them. Moreover, the things of the world need not be sinister in order to be diverting and consuming. For the serious disciple, the cardinal attributes exemplified by the resurrected Jesus are not optional. These developmental milestones take the form of traits, traits which mark the trail to be traveled. After all, should not Latter-day Saints have a special interest in what is required to become a saint, virtue by virtue and quality by quality? Hear the words of King Benjamin and becometh a saint, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, and then as if for special emphasis, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon him, even as a child does submit to his father. These attributes are eternal and portable. Being portable to the degree developed they will go with us through the veil of death, and still later they will also rise with us in the resurrection when all else stays behind. Meanwhile, ironically, so much of our time is devoted to learning and marketing perishable skills, which will soon become obsolete. It isn't just the morticians who will have a vocational crisis in the next world, brothers and sisters. Please note several additions to these key qualities. And now I would that you should be humble and be submissive and gentle, easy to be entreated, full of patience and long-suffering, being temperate in all things. Unsurprisingly, the disciples' way of using power and authority will reflect these same qualities. For he is to lead by persuasion, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, love unfeigned, and kindness. Such should become our leadership style. It is certainly Jesus's. Numerous other scriptures describe the same small cluster of spiritual qualities which the men and women of Christ are to strive to achieve in their lives, the outcomes that should be there for each of us. When significantly developed, these qualities will convey the added authority of example, and you and I have seen that authority, and we are filled with admiration for it. Since Christ also declared, If ye love me, keep my commandments, Clear and specific obligations clearly rest upon us, especially when we ponder this next commandment, which, if we love him, we will strive to keep. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which in heaven is perfect. The Greek rendering for perfect is, by the way, complete, finished, fully developed. After his atonement and resurrection, Jesus included himself as our pattern. Therefore, I would that ye should be perfect, even as I or your Father who is in heaven is perfect. One of the problems we have in the Church is that we consider perfection in abstraction, and it becomes too intimidating. But when we think of it in terms of the specific cardinal attributes, and we strive to develop these in a steady process of self-improvement. It's quite a different matter. Ponder this ancient self-description with its focus on attributes. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful 
and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. When Jesus visited his hometown on one occasion, the people wondered at his gracious words. What is enjoined upon us, therefore, brothers and sisters, is thus very specific. The specific qualities are made clear again and again in the scriptures. Made likewise clear is our need to follow the developmental path. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. And again, it showeth unto the children of men the straightness of the path and the narrowness of the gate by which they should enter, he having set the example before them. These qualities are not only developmental destinations, but meanwhile, if they are developed significantly, they also provide us with the balance urgently needed for traveling on the demanding straight and narrow path. It is so easy to fall off one side or the other of that path. The divine direction is clear. Behold, I am the light. I have set an example for you. Too often, when you and I seek to excuse ourselves from this developmental journey, it is ironically the natural man we are excusing. Yet scriptures inform us the natural man is to be put off. He certainly should not be kept on because of a mistaken sense that the natural man constitutes our individuality. In this process, substance and style interplay constantly more than we realize. How, for instance, can we be like the Father and Son if we are poor listeners? How can we become even as Jesus is if we are impatient or proud? The gospel also gives us proportion as between style and substance. For example, it is far more important to be morally clean than to be a clean desk individual. Similarly, it is better to speak the truth in love, as Paul counsels, than it is simply to speak the truth. These scriptural virtues are intertwined, interactive, and interdependent. We are to be meek and humble, not self-concerned, dismissive, proud, or seeking ascendancy. To which I add, blessed are the meek, because they are not easily offended. Besides, those who shine as lights in the world have no need to seek the spotlight. The world's spotlights are not only fleeting, but they employ a, an inferior light. We are to be patient, not hectic, hurried, and pushy. We are to be full of love, not demanding, dominating, harsh, and manipulative, and condescending. We are to be gentle, not coarse brusque, or vindictive. We are to be easily entreated, not unapproachable, inaccessible, and non-listening. We are to be long-suffering, not impatient, disinterested, curt, easily offended. There are so many people in the Church, brothers and sisters, waiting to be offended. And it doesn't take long. If one has a chip on his or her shoulder, you can't make it through the foyer, so to speak, without getting it knocked off. We're to be submissive to God, not resistant to the Spirit or to counsel or to life's lessons. We're to be temperate, meaning self-restrained, not egoistic, eager for attention and recognition, or too talkative. In your life and mine, the great moments of commendation and correction have come usually in one-liners. We're to be merciful, not judgmental and unforgiving. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall know the caress of causality, as their forgiving mercy restores others to wholeness. Though God is perfected in the attributes of justice and mercy, we read that, finally, mercy overpowereth justice. We're to be gracious, not tactless, easily irritated, and ungenerous. We're to be holy, 
not worldly. As you and I think about the process of becoming the men and women of Christ, questions may naturally arise, such as, will all the men and women of Christ be alike in every respect? Will there be a loss of individuality? I think not. For instance, the quality of meekness is clearly essential, but there are so many individual ways of expressing meekness. Furthermore, what you and I now defensively regard as constituting our individuality is likely to be significantly refined. There is an immense developmental clue to be found in these next words. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. By being yoked, we can best learn of Jesus' perfected qualities, though only in our comparatively small ways. If we are meek, through our smaller but similar experiences, we will come to appreciate Jesus' perfected qualities even more. And then, brothers and sisters, our adoration of him produces a desire for emulation of him. The prophet Joseph, <clears throat> whose own life was lived in a crescendo of self-improvement amid adversity, observed, quote, The nearer man approaches perfection, the clearer are his views, and the greater his enjoyments, till he has overcome the evils of his life and lost every desire for sin. And like the ancients, arrives at the point of faith where he is wrapped in the power and glory of his Maker and is caught up to dwell with him. But we consider that this is a station to which no man ever arrived in a moment. The clearer one's views, the more we see things as they really are, and the greater the happiness. Thus, beyond the free gift of immortality, Working out our salvation includes working out the development of these eternal virtues in our lives. Given the tremendous importance of these virtues now and in the world to come, should you and I be surprised if, to hasten the process, the Lord gives us individually the relevant and necessary clinical experiences? We don't usually seek these, however. Yet they seem to come, don't they? Even when we don't remember having signed up for a particular course. Sometimes we find ourselves enrolled again in the same course. <laughs> Apparently we were only auditing before. <coughs> Perhaps this time it can be for credit. Emerson pled. Give me truths, for I am weary of the surfaces. You and I live in a world amid so much that is inane. We're surrounded by so many little and superficial things. It is only in the bright light of the restored gospel that we can see the truth, who we really are, what our possibilities really are. Jacob wrote, we not only see things as they really are, but as they really will be. The Lord loves each of us too much to merely let us go on being what we now are, because he knows what we have the possibilities to become. It's really all part of the journey of going home. Developmentally, we are all prodigals. When we come to ourselves spiritually, we too will say with determination, I will arise and go to my Father. Thus, the true celebration of the risen Lord of Easter is one of emulation as well as adoration for him. Since he is risen from the grave, let us not be dead as to the things of the Spirit. How can we celebrate the empty tomb with empty lives? How can we celebrate his victory over death by being defeated by the world? May I now speak further to you of Jesus, of the resurrection, and of the atonement. 
Christ's death and resurrection were specifically foretold in a multitude of scriptures, including this one from Isaiah. Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Ponder how dramatically that prophecy was later fulfilled as recorded by Matthew. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. As signified by Jesus' personal resurrection and the recognition of him by friends, immortality is not being one droplet in some floating sea of cosmic consciousness. Resurrection is not being a mere molecule in an unremembering cloud of drifting molecules. Jesus' resurrection was personal and recognizable. So will ours be. Did not the resurrected saints go into Jerusalem and appear unto many? Oh, how we adore Jesus for his atonement, for his free gift of immortality to us all. Consider for a moment, how would we regard Christ without the reality of his atonement and resurrection? How would we regard the Sermon on the Mount without the resurrection of the sermon giver? and eventually all of us. Without the reality of God's plan of salvation and Jesus' atonement, how could the meek truly inherit the earth? How could the pure in heart really see God? No wonder Paul wrote of Christ the following, In him all things hold together. When collectively or individually, brothers and sisters, Things seem to fly apart for us at times. What fitting imagery. In him, all things hold together. Given the centrality of the doctrine of resurrection, the restoration has as one of its main purposes to witness not only of Jesus' resurrection, but that of all mankind. And righteousness will I send down out of heaven, and truth will I send forth out of the earth, to bear testimony of mine only begotten, his resurrection from the dead, and also the resurrection of all men. There are so many ways in which Christ holds all things together. In fact, the scriptures advise, all things bear record of me. At Christmas time, for instance, we celebrate a special star which announced Jesus' birth at Bethlehem. Thus, the so-called little star of Bethlehem was actually very large in its declaration of divine design. That star would have had to have been placed in its precise orbit centuries before it shone so precisely. Pervasive divine design is thus underscored in what the Lord has said. All things must come to pass in their time. God's overseeing precision pertains not only to astrophysical orbits, but to human orbits as well. This is a stunning and sobering thing for us to contemplate, because each of us is in our own orbit, and we have obligations to shine as lights within that orbit. In Jesus, there is a unique blend of both meekness and majesty. Though the Lord of the universe, Christ was meekly willing to live in this world, which he created under the Father's direction. In Paul's words, Jesus agreed to reside on earth as a person of no reputation. We sing of his birth. The stars in the heavens looked down where he lay. The onlooking universe was created by him under the Father's direction, involving, we are told, worlds without number. Thus, the meek Christ child was cradled not only in a manger, but he was also cradled in the majesty of his own vast creations. Even the least of these, when we contemplate the heavens, 
permits us to see God moving in his majesty and power. Do you and I not sing the hymn occasionally about how all the worlds thy hands have made? On the Eastern Hemisphere, the special star which signaled his meek birth was recognized only by a few shepherds and several wise men. However, when Christ comes in majesty and power, the sign of his second coming will be given, and all flesh shall see it together. Jesus declares, all flesh shall see me together. What an impending moment of unparalleled majesty for the millennial Messiah. Yet it was preceded by the meekness of his mortal messiahship. He created worlds, and yet he was merely regarded as being a carpenter's son. He called and inspired Old Testament prophets. Yet Jesus was regarded by some in the meridian of time as being less than Moses and Abraham. In his meek mortal ministry, Jesus spoke of how he had other sheep. Still later, when with those other sheep on this hemisphere, he spoke of still other sheep whom he would visit. Brothers and sisters, how many folds and flocks does he have? We do not know. But there are inklings of his majesty. For by him and through him and of him the worlds are and were created and the inhabitants thereof are begotten sons and daughters unto God. Yes, this great and true shepherd in meekness revealed to a solitary Samaritan woman that indeed he was the Messiah. Because Jesus was brilliant beyond our comprehension, he knew even pre-mortally, but only intellectually, what he was volunteering to do as the Redeemer of mankind. He had to experience it all personally, especially the awful agony of Gethsemane and Calvary. He who is more intelligent than they all is also more meek than they all. He went meekly forward and partook of history's most bitter cup, and he did so without becoming bitter. Jesus descended below all things in order to be able to comprehend all things. Thus, he is not only a fully atoning Savior, but he is also a fully comprehending Savior. Somehow, Christ came to know, just as specifically prophesied, our griefs, sorrows, pains, sicknesses, afflictions, and infirmities. He did so, declared Alma, that he might come to know, according to the flesh, how to succor and to help us in the midst of our infirmities. Only in the Restoration Scriptures, specifically the Book of Mormon, is Jesus' atonement referred to as the infinite atonement. It was infinite in several dimensions. First, in what is called the great and last sacrifice, the sacrifice of a mere animal or an imperfect mortal would not do. It required the sacrifice of an infinite being, an eternal and sinless God. Jesus, you will recall, volunteered premortally. Here am I, send me. Never has anyone offered to do so much for so many with so few words. As an infinite being, Jesus had the unique power to put down and to take up his life. Jesus' atonement also had infinite impact, affecting all mankind. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Third, his atonement involved infinite suffering, suffering beyond our comprehension. I will now note especially that suffering. The atonement fulfills so many prophecies. 
Jesus was to be spat upon, struck, scourged. He would be given vinegar and gall. He would issue a soul cry, the very words of which were prophesied by David in a messianic psalm. None of his bones was to be broken. We begin to see in the scriptures the weight of the atonement burdening him shortly before Gethsemane and Calvary. On one occasion, he said, probably on the courtyard of the temple, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. And then, as if in soliloquy, he said, But for this hour, this cause, came I unto this hour. The full weight fell upon him as he entered the Garden of Gethsemane, where we read that he fell on the ground. He did not kneel down neatly, primly, and briefly, and pray, and that was it. He fell on the ground. At one point in Gethsemane, an angel appeared to strengthen him. Here we see the keenest of all intellects to ever grace this planet, enduring sufferings which were worse than even he, with his unexcelled brilliance, had ever imagined. Hence, as we read, he was sore amazed, or in the Greek, astonished, awestruck. He became, we read, very heavy, which in the Greek means depressed and dejected. Then in the garden, he issued what is called the Abba cry. It was the most intimate, familial cry of a child in the deepest of distress for his father. All the cumulative weight of our sins, those of the whole human family, fell upon him. He and he alone bore them. Thus he is able to say, I have overcome and have trodden the winepress alone even the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. Think of that phrase, brothers and sisters. The fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. This would include all the penalties which a just God, who cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance, would require. Could there be any wrath more fierce than divine wrath? Especially as God's purity has encountered over the centuries cumulative mortal grossness, including the vilest of all human sins. Jesus bore them. Indeed, he was alone for none was with me. His astonishing personal triumph was complete. Yet he who premortally had promised he would give glory to our Father kept that promise, saying after accomplishing the atonement, nevertheless, glory be to the Father. Several years ago, <clears throat> Christian physicians wrote in the Journal of American Medicine indicating that they felt, because of the loss of blood when Jesus was scourged, that he would have been in serious, if not critical, condition before he ever carried a portion of his cross to Calvary. Other scholars say that Jesus was likely scourged with a Roman flagellum something like what you and I would call a cat of nine tails, with sharp metallic objects at the end of each thong. If Jesus assumed the usual posture for scourging, it would have been kneeling before his scourger so that the muscles of the back were tensed 
and thus would be more easily torn and shredded. He would have bled profusely and would have lost much blood in addition to what he lost earlier while bleeding at every pore in Gethsemane. No wonder he needed help to carry the cross. Jesus bore all mortal sins, mankind's cumulative total, a total which exceeded the sum of all the parts, including the sins of even the worst and vilest sinners of all human history. Thus Jesus, of his suffering, could truly say later that, quote, he descended below all things. The severe requirements of divine justice were such that while <clears throat> Jesus was on the cross, wrote Elder James Talmadge, in order that the supreme sacrifice of the Son might be consummated in all its fullness, the Father seems to have withdrawn the support of his immediate presence, leaving the Savior of men the glory of complete victory over the forces of sin and death. But what an awful and awesome aloneness! No wonder the cry of forsakenness split the air over Calvary. What deprivation! especially after the special and extended closeness of the Father and the Son. Jesus had always had his Father's Spirit to be with him, but he was apparently left alone. And there then came the soul-rending cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What an awful aloneness. Is it possible, brothers and sisters, that Jesus needed to suffer and experience aloneness not only so his personal triumph would be total, but also in order that he might know, as Alma says, according to the flesh, what it's like to feel forsaken? In any case, he felt forsaken and alone. Compared to his feeling forsaken, what are our occasional feelings of being forsaken and alone? Or our personal feelings of being unnoticed and unappreciated? Or our individual deprivations? All of this emptying agony preceded the empty tomb which signified the glorious resurrection, as our choir will sing in closing. In his later comments on the awful but glorious atonement, Jesus uses words like sore and exquisite. Jesus tells us that he suffered both body and spirit, the compounding of pain. Interestingly, he does not mention having been spat upon, struck, receiving vinegar and gall, being scourged, etc. He does say that he trembled because of pain, and would that he might not shrink. That is, that he might not fail to go forward and partake fully of the bitter cup and finish the atonement. As already indicated, he partook of the bitter cup and did so without becoming bitter. Mercifully, for all of us, he did not shrink. All that moment, he said, and behold, I am the light and the life of the world, and I have drunk of that bitter cup, which the Father hath given me, and have glorified the Father in taking upon me the sins of the world in the which I have suffered the will of the Father in all things from the beginning. I have overcome and have trodden the winepress alone, even the winepress of the fierceness 
of the wrath of Almighty God. Jesus thus became our fully comprehending and fully atoning Savior. No wonder we sing of him, how great thou art. Why did he do it? And the world, because of their iniquity, shall judge him to be a thing of naught. Wherefore they scourge him, and he suffereth it, and they smite him, and he suffereth it. Yea, they spit upon him, and he suffereth it. Why? Because of his loving kindness and his long suffering towards the children of men. Ponder, if you will, for a moment the word loving kindness. It is a special word. It is a glorious attribute. David, after he had sinned so grievously, said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Hold that special word in your minds a bit longer as I read these verses <clears throat> about when Jesus comes in majesty. These are dramatic verses, verses describing an, append, an impending event of great majesty. And it shall be said, Who is this? that cometh down from God in heaven with dyed garments. Yea, from the regions which are not known, clothed in his glorious apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. And the Lord shall be red in his apparel, and his garments like him that treadeth in the wine vat. And so great shall be the glory of his presence, that the sun shall hide his face in shame, and the moon shall withhold its light, and the stars shall be hurled from their places, and his voice shall be heard. I have trodden the winepress alone, and have brought judgment upon all people and none was with me. And now the year of my redeemed is come, and they shall mention the loving kindness of their Lord, and all that he has bestowed upon them according to his goodness and according to his loving kindness forever and ever. Blessed be God the Father for his loving kindness in giving to us his only begotten as our Redeemer. We do not know, nor could we appreciate if we did, the feelings of the Father as he watched his firstborn go through the atonement. But how great our Father is. Blessed be the Son, Jesus Christ, for his loving kindness in atoning for our sins. In the words of our hymn, I scarce can take it in. Whenever, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> you and I witness and experience in a human being impressive loving kindness, we marvel and we should marvel. But such highly developed loving kindness is still not closely comparable to Jesus' loving kindness. So it is with each of his qualities about which we have spoken tonight. When we are fortunate enough to experience the stirring samples of likeness, these are real and wonderful experiences but they are not yet fullness. They are not yet the fullness found in Jesus. Even so, he of fullness clearly and kindly 
beckons us to develop that greater likeness in our lives which precedes fullness. It is that likeness that will give us the light in our lives so that we might do, as Paul says, shine as lights in the world. These are the attributes that convey to us the added authority of example. And as we emulate him by developing likeness in these attributes, he will bless us and magnify us for his purposes. My quorum president, President Howard W. Hutter, said 26 years ago in April General Conference, he loves the Lord with all his heart who loves nothing in comparison of him and nothing but in reference to him. As one of his special witnesses, I testify to you tonight that he is risen. And how marvelous it is, even given the great distance of the trek spoken of earlier, he beckons us to develop this likeness so that one day we may have fullness with him. It is the journey of journeys. Nothing else is even remotely comparable to it in its importance. There is nothing in comparison of him. Indeed, as Paul said, in Christ all things hold together. That is my witness to you on this Easter night. The reality of his mercy, the genuineness of his loving kindness. And he has said to us, what manner of men and women ought you to be? And I say unto you, even as I am, what an invitation. And implicit in that invitation is the possibility of its realization. I salute you for who you are, but more importantly, for what you have the possibilities to become. There is none like him. And as he has said to us in the marvelous imagery of Holy Scriptures, I wait for you with open arms. But it is we who must go to him in this journey of journeys. Finally, I witness to you as to the reality of the great atonement. It is the central act of all human history. Nothing else even approaches it remotely in terms of significance. Meek Jesus, here am I, send me. And the Jesus who will come in majesty and who says of that impressive, powerful moment, what we will say of him is that we will hail him for his loving kindness. If we love him, we must so love one another. He is risen. And the symbol of Christianity might well be the empty tomb, which bespeaks the fullness of the great atonement, of which I testify to you tonight in love and in appreciation and in recognition of who you really are as I bear this witness to you humbly, lovingly, but most importantly, in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen.